Welcome everyone to our latest webinar. Today we're talking about aligning channel marketing and sales. We've got a five-step approach for you today. Uh, we are going to have some time at the end to answer questions. So as we go through this, if you have any questions, please uh, enter them. There's a question section within the GoToWebinar interface, and we will take time at the end to answer those. We're also going to have a recording of this along with the slides. We'll make sure to send those out to you uh, via email um, shortly after the webinar concludes. So we'll have that information available for you as a follow-on as well. Um, today we are joined by John Erickson of Channel Impact he's going to be sharing with us and also Stephen Kellum is going to be uh, is going to be presenting today. Tim Co at the end as well if you'd like to follow up with them. Uh, next slide is just a glance at the agenda that we have today. Uh, we've got five steps as I mentioned by talking about the customer, uh, then we'll talk about strategic options, we'll talk about systems approaches to sales capacity, uh, we'll outline a partner success formula and kind of what goes into that, um, and then lastly we'll talk about execution and adoption and how to really drive these things. At the end we'll have a little wrap up about lessons learned. We're going to kick it off this morning with just a little bit of table setting, talking about kind of how we arrived at this, what's driving this discussion, and then we'll get into the five steps. I'm going to turn to John off with that uh, tip at the, at the beginning here. And as I said, if you have questions at the end, uh, we will have some time to go through those, so please enter those as we move through. All right, thank you. Um, good morning, this is John Erickson from Channel Impact, and thanks for attending the webinar today. To kind of set the table for this, I'm assuming that most of the people here have their job in uh, channel marketing and they're interested in things like improving your for your spend through MDF and that kind of thing. And if you look at that, you know, part of the thing that people traditionally have looked at in terms of improving ROI is, um, you know, how do I change the mix of my activities and figure out which ones are the ones that are working? Um, how do I look at the MDF best practices and apply those to my particular situation to get a higher return? And although I would submit to you that those are good things to do. Um, the content of this webinar is actually a bit different. So if we took a step back, if you're just optimizing what you have, you know, you can only make minimal improvements. And so I would submit to you that maybe one thing that you might want to do is actually take one step back from that and start from the beginning and look at how that we can best align both the marketing and sales function uh, to achieve a better return overall, and then that will feed into your MDF and the kind of things that you look at. And if you take that sort of approach, you have a much better chance of getting higher leverage out of the, the kind of things that you do and how do you interact with your sales and your partners. So uh, thanks, John. And hi, hi, this is Stephen. And, and, and the slide that I have that sort of tees it up is the beginning of point for so many of the conversations that, that we, we have today. And because the reality is that uh, your customers, uh, customers' world is changing quite a bit because their customer, the ultimate end user's world, has changed so much with, with, the, with the buyer's journey. And to me, it's been fascinating to watch how everyone to, went from the, the word cloud to the word uh, buyer's journey. And, and there's no question that it's just had tr tremendous impact. This is a pretty interesting slide. There's a, there's a, there's a link here uh, to, to a really nice Google uh, video on uh, zero moment of truth. And, and, and that's really talking about you know 60 to 80 percent of the decision has already been made uh, before someone engages uh, with it with a salesperson and it's really hitting our channel partners hard it, it's flipping a lot of their worlds upside down um, and I started talking to John before we even did this webinar about okay sales and marketing are, are have to work together like never before to be successful uh, both to the partner and for the partner and through the partner and so we thought it'd be a really uh, good idea to, to come in and chat a little bit about how to, how to really align that, that sales and that marketing. So uh, with that, I'm going to let John start with um, the, the uh, step one. Yeah, thanks.
quicker way to, to, to get a plan. Uh, but, but as you, we jump into an example here, I think you had told me an example of someone who, who tried this and, and, and uh, the benchmarking angle and ended up really selling the product incorrectly and, and not very effectively. Yeah, and so, for example, that was looking at bringing a brand new product to market, and so they, you know, it was much different they sold than their other products, and the people that had traditionally sold it were not in, not in high tech, but in a different market segment, and so they asked us to do, you know, a channel analysis of who that they could possibly use for it, how that they should sell it, and they look at a bunch of competitors, and we suggested that in addition to that, that we wanted to talk to a number of their customers. And what we found out is that actually that the product was being sold primarily on price and um, in a reactive mode to kind of people that were in a people that were in an operations kind of function. But the reality was that most of the companies needed it in in order to improve the productivity of their employees. And the product paid for itself many times over if that you actually did it the right way. And so if we had just taken the, the benchmarking results of how other people sold it, then we would have been in a price-driven kind of reactive sale. But since that we understood the market from a better standpoint, we were able to focus on a different buyer, target a higher value channel, and target a, a different buyer for it. Um, they allowed it to be sold at a premium price point, but also, you know, in a way that it needs that weren't being addressed uh, via the current, um, the current kind of routes to market from the competition. So uh, we'll go, so on that um, perspective of the customer, let's do a, a customer feedback, uh, typical findings that we'd see. And so this is based on, you know, a summation of some work we've done from different people. And so this doesn't represent any one company, but it does represent things that we found in aggregate through some of our experience. And so, you know, we talked about the questions asked. When we looked at this particular example, we found that both the enterprise and the mid-market Customers actually had a fairly large market size. Both of them were greater than 10 billion, and of that 10, of the total market size, 55% of the market was in the enterprise customers, who had about 10,000 you know, possible targets. 45% of the TAM was in the mid-market and SMB, which had about 200,000 of the best targets, but many more than that overall, and so. You know, there was big TAM on both sides, but the dynamics of how many customers that you need to interact with in order to reach that TAM are quite different. Um, the customers told us that they expected to buy many products. Uh, this was a multi-product uh, multi company or vendor that we were working with. Um, they wanted four to five product categories that they expected to buy from that company in the next two to three years for enterprise and three to four um, in the mid-market. We also found that um, the number of partners that they typically use to deliver uh, or to, to buy as a customer was one to four in the enterprise space, but of those, 50% of them typically used only one partner for these product categories. And then in the mid-market and SMB space, it was, they use one to three um, partners per company, but 70% of the customers in that space actually used only one partner. And so, you know, one partner that was delivering for the needs of most of the customers in both the enterprise and mid-market, and they were selling across multiple product categories, which leads you to believe they, they need to sell across their portfolio versus being specialists, for example. Um, from an expectation on the product and the associated service, on the enterprise side, about 75% said they wanted the partner that they bought through to be delivering the product and service together. And then there was some of them that had a big enough internal staff that they actually did the service themselves, and so they, they could buy from just someone that was uh, just delivering the product. But when we moved over to the mid-market and SMB, then the expectation was the partner was supposed to deliver both. And so, you know, if the, you look at this, you see that um, the requirements from a service perspective and therefore from a skills perspective is actually higher on the mid-market than the enterprise, or at least both of them are both of them require significant levels of skill. And you no, know, this might have been different than what you would think just from intuition. And as it relates to uh, complementary products, the 
enterprise and the mid-market customers, at least for this specific kind of example, didn't expect complementary products besides the four or five categories to necessarily be sold to get sold together through the same uh, channel. Yeah, you know, John, these are great data points. And, you know, I used to live in the S&B mid-market side of things. And my, my favorite one on this is when you talk about the partners to deliver both both together, right? And, and we're really talking about services for these guys. And, and, and I, I don't think I can overemphasize uh, how those services are important to the, to the success of, of, of these organizations. For sure. And so, I mean, if you look at it, then that's good news from you as a vendor standpoint and the fact that partners typically make higher gross margin on their own services. And so that becomes a part of your value proposition as you're looking to recruit and also to show the value to your existing partners of that you know that you provide not only a good platform for sale of or sale or resale of your own product or cloud service or what have you, but also that there's a significant amount of the partner's own services that can be um, done with the customer at high margin. Yeah, I think we could do a webinar. You could talk about all the things that the partners need to be able to uh, become either enabled in or, or grow their skills from sales, marketing, certification, so uh, just pretty much, pretty, much, pretty much every angle. So, so with that in mind about the customer, I think next really uh, you, you talk about moving to uh, here, here's, here's my strategy, right? Here, here's now how I need to think about this. Yeah, and so the reason why that we went and collected the information from the, from the customers is we wanted to make sure that how that we were shaping our sales coverage model, how that we were shaping our partner selection, how that we're shaping our partner program, um, and our enablement is actually along the lines of what the customer is telling us that they need. And so, you know, a couple, and we hit on a few of these in the previous slide, but a couple of the key takeaways that we find from the data that the customer told us is, the mid-market is a significant portion of the part of the um, TAM, it was about 45% of the TAM, but it's going to require a different sales model because the, the number of accounts that you need to reach was about 20x the number that you had in enterprise. Um, the customers told us that they were buying multiple products uh, or they expected to buy multiple product categories of this vendor uh, over the next uh, one to three years and because of this then we need our partners in general to be multi-product capable. We found out that the partners required high service skills and that that was even more true in the mid-market, which might be different than what most people would expect. Um, from, a, from a manufacturer perspective or from a, a company perspective who's the provider of the product, you know, their economic drivers are actually selling across the portfolio and acquiring new customers because there was a huge number of possible targets in the mid-market as that you saw. And we also found that it was less important to have technology alliances. That goes back to the point that the customers told us they weren't expecting complementary products to necessarily sell with this. And there was less importance on specialist partners because most of the customers told us that they were using one partner and they expected to buy multiple product categories. And if you have specialists in there, then you're either going to require multiple specialists to work together or that you're only going to sell whatever the specialist sells and you're going to miss out on the other product categories that the, you know, that the customer said that they would like to buy from you. You know, John, and as we move into the next slide, I think this is a little different from our typical uh, marketing slides where you're taking those strategic uh, outlines and now looking at something uh, really in the sales piece here, right, in a, in, in a, a systematic approach to the, the sales capacity. Yeah, for sure. And I think that, you know, my whole, you know, my whole set of learnings, at least from my own background of working, you know, across both sales and channels over time is that um, you have to make the sales and the channel and the marketing component work together. And if that you don't, then you're not affected. And so, you know, now that we've kind of defined, you know, what our strategic alternatives are or what we think the key drivers are, um, we now need to take a look at sales capacity. And, you know, I would submit to you that the sales capacity model and the things that, you know, impact your, your productivity there are different depending on what market segment that you're in. And so what we have here up top is some chevrons that go through a typical sales six-step sales cycle, and on the enterprise side, you see moving from lead gen to qualified to pre-sales, 
those activities are color-coded blue, which means that those typically would be expected to be done by the vendor or on the accounts that they're familiar with and in every day. And then if you're doing things right, then at some point in time, you're handing off the rest of the job to your partners so that you can go and chase the next um, front end of the next enterprise sales cycle. And so you're expecting the partner to close, do post-sales, do renewals. And if you do this right, then you can actually offload 50% of the steps and probably more than 50% of the work to the channel, and therefore you can allow your, your salespeople to become that much more productive. As we come down into the mid-market, which is the one on the bottom, um, you see that the steps in the sales cycle are exactly the same, but who does them is actually uh, changing. And so there's a big need for lead generation in the mid-market because although that the partner has lower cost of sales than the vendor does, um, they actually still need to spend their time calling on accounts with high probability of sale. And that means there needs to be done some level of qualification of accounts before that they spend their time on them. And so the function of lead generation is actually more important than the, in the um, mid-market than it is in the enterprise because the lead generation in enterprise is coming from your sales reps that's in a name set of accounts all the time and they can play that function for you. But the function of lead generation in mid-market needs to be much more through a coordinated you know, demand generation and nurturing process and that kind of thing. And then once you get those to a certain level, you hand off most of those activities to your channel, need much less salespeople or the same number of salespeople reaching a much greater number of accounts. So net net, you know, the key takeaway from this is that by the sales cycle, although the steps are who does them is different than the mid market. And if you look down below um, in the in the kind of table, it shows where your bottlenecks are likely to occur. And so in the enterprise sales cycle, the thing that's going to stop you from making more sales is not having enough outside salespeople to reach the accounts that you need to and not handing off the, um, the tasks to your channel at an early enough point in time to help make those people more productive. And so when you see an enterprise sales team with low productivity, then normally what's happening you know, more often than not is actually that you're not handing off the job to the partner at the at the earlier point in time, and as a result, you're having to go all the way through the process. And if you go all the way through the process, then you have much less time to go and find the next job on the front end. And so you're going to be bottlenecked by either your partner enablement capability or your outside sales. When we come to the mid market, you know, the concept of add a salesperson and get a million bucks or three million bucks or whatever the number is. That no longer applies because your things that bottleneck you in the mid-market is actually, um, do you have the partners enabled? Are you doing the right work between your field marketing team and your marketing demand generation program so that you're actually creating a consistent stream of leads and cadence that people can follow up on? And do you have the right uh, enablement and, and partner program dollars in place to drive the partner to do the things that you want in the sales cycle, which are more extensive than what you wanted in the enterprise side. Yeah, John, you know, we, we at CCI, we, we sort of live over in that uh, mid-market small uh, side up there where you, where you have the highs there. And, and we see, this is why we see so much involvement with uh, uh, folks like the, the growth of, of the TPMAs, the through partner marketing uh, agencies out uh, there and then you know, the folks like MarketStar, right? Or even the the outsourced uh, sales side for uh, effect effectiveness there. And and I, and I think that that really ties in well to you know who is transitioned well, to, and then what would be uh, are are stuck you know creating a mini enterprise where they, they could could have actually uh, changed things up, right? And and more cost effectively uh, uh, move, move to the move to that mid market side. Yeah, and so the the core concept here is that when you're when you're working in the mid market space, you know normally what happens in a lot of sales organizations is that I'm not selling enough, and so I'm going to add in a bunch of salespeople. And when they when that you add salespeople on top of salespeople in in the mid market space, you know that's not your bottleneck. Your bottleneck is having that balanced out with the other elements of the number of partners and and your demand generation and all that kind of thing. And so. The concept is you need the right level of balance across
across kind of the sales supply chain in both enterprise and in um, mid-market. And if it, you add resources to an area that isn't bottlenecked, you don't get more throughput. And so as an example of that, I, you know, we work across a number of companies and benchmark and, you know, work with them to improve sales over time. And so if you apply an enterprise sales model um, to your market for mid-market, you're going to end up, you know, spending money, you know, typically along the, you, if you look at the column for many enterprise, you'll spend some in demand generation, but probably not as, mu not as much as what you need. Partner programs, not as much as what you need. Your enablement, you know, might be okay. And then most of your money is spent on outside sales and inside sales. But when you're in the mid-market and below, you can't reach enough accounts you know, effectively to actually generate the productivity that they need, and therefore you end up with a much higher cost of sales, you know, in the range of 4%. Start taking that next transition, and you say, all right, the, you know, I need my partner more money in demand generation, and I need less per as a percentage in outside sales and inside sales, because if I do the right things with my partners, then they should be able to have a much greater leverage with the number of partners versus needing to do as many things themselves. And you start to see the cost of sales come down more into the 28% uh, percent range. And then as you, you get the cadence better, and so you're spending similar money in the marketing, partner programs, and partner enablement, but you're more mature, and you become better at the interaction between them, then you can actually move down into the 22% range, which is about half as much as what you're spending on the mini enterprise side. And an interesting point that I would bring to is if you looked at most cloud companies, most of their most of their kind of customers are in the mid-market space and most of their sales forces are behaving as if they're enterprise. And so therefore that's why a lot of cloud companies don't make the money that they should because they actually are employing the wrong sales model uh, for the customers that they're trying to reach. Yeah, John, I think that really uh, ties in well then into, you know, your, your, your next step and, you know, how do you take this and how do you build your partner success formula? Yeah, and so, you know, now that we've kind of, you know, established, you know, the base, you know, we've established our strategy, we've looked at how that we're um, building sales capacity and doing it the right way, um, dependent on market segment, then if you want to maximize your sales as a vendor, you have met, you, you have you know, constraint of resources, constraint of money, constraint of, you know, many things, systems and that kind of thing in your environment. And so one of the things that you need to spend your time doing is actually having, cutting back the number of things that you do and the number of people that you work with so that you can actually put more wood behind the arrow of the things that you actually are doing. And so if you're looking at that, then that comes down to, no, step one, select your right partners. And so out of all the partners that you're working with, who's the ones that you should be really spending your time with and doing planning and all that kind of thing? And then once that you select them, then what do you do after that to make sure that they have the maximum probability of success? How do you spend your time with them? And so you know, the very simple way to think about that is select the right partners and do the right things. And as a result, you're actually going to spend, you're going to do less things with less people, but you're going to get better results. Yeah, once again, you, you could do a whole webinar on that. We, you know, we run into folks, um, just recently we ran into someone who was trying to consolidate globally and had uh, 42 different programs uh, that they were running uh, for incentives. And uh, every single geo had their, their, and region had their own way of doing it. You know, and John, we had a really interesting conversation about, you know, one, do we do we have the right partners? But uh, two, um, you know, how do we do fewer things and, and, and do them better? Yeah, and I mean, you know, from my background of looking at things from an analytical perspective and a sales perspective, I mean, if I bring in a statistician and, they, and I tell them, um, go and figure out for me, here's a data set with all the activities we're doing and the incremental sales and the impact on the people that we think it should have been impacting, how many of these things show statistical significance that they're really moving the needle? You know, people will give me a list of you no, know, oftentimes greater than 20 things that they're doing, and, and the number of those that actually end up showing any any um, signal when that you run it through kind of a statistics standpoint would be some somewhere about three to five. So people might do a lot of things, but most of them don't actually do much. 
And so you'd be better off either, you know, figuring out which things do work for you and reallocating the money over there or spending time on one or two of the things that aren't working, you know, to root cause them and, and get them to the point where they are working. But no, back to the initial point. So it's selecting the right partner. So we talked about that you need um, a different approach for different market segments. And so I would suggest that you would want to repeat this exercise um, times the number of market segments that you guys are specifically looking at for your company. And the way that we've done it um, is actually taking your historical partner uh, database and who's selling into what market, and then we'll run statistics on it and analyze who's consistent and random. Random meaning that they might sell in the space, but they're not consistently doing it, and now it just happens to be opportunistic. And then from the consistent partners in a given space, then we'll come up with a set of criteria that, you know, that ranks those ones that have proven to be consistent from top to bottom. And then you'll have a list of the partners that you should go after in what order. And if you don't have enough, then you can the line wherever that you want at number 50 or number 150. The other thing that comes out of this is from the way that, um, from the partners we know that are consistent, then we can start to develop an ideal partner profile along other dimensions besides what they do with you, like what other vendors do they work with, how do they represent themselves to the market, um, you know, what kind of service capabilities do they have, and then that ideal partner profile can be matched up with partners that aren't consistent in your database to see who might be a good candidate for developing, or it could be used for recruitment of new partners. So that's to select the right partner piece. And then once that you do select the right partners and you have a finite number of them, and so let's assume now that we're working at the top end where that we might have a partner account manager, um, a field marketing person that's working with them, et cetera, then there should be a finite set of activities that you do with these partners, and the activities should be done on a specific frequency. And so this is an example of, uh, you know, a partner uh, field activity uh, model that's been put in place it recognizes that there's different people in an organization that's touching each partner and who needs to be involved in that partner to vendor annual plan, um, who needs to be involved in the quarterly review, who needs to be involved in the marketing execution, et cetera. And so you put, you, you create, you know, a little, not only of what the activities are, but who participates. And ideally you would also designate who is the owner of each activity versus a participant. So annual partner to vendor plan. The partner account manager should probably take the lead there, but there would be participation from sales, inside sales and marketing. So this is the point of doing the right thing. So do so you've selected the right partners, now you're you're figuring out, you know, what things that you're going to do with them. And now you have a, a plan of attack for moving forward with those partners. And no known, known responsibilities in each group. So now that we have that done, then there, we need to start focusing on execution and adoption. And so the key points here would be that you'd be much better off to have fewer things that you're doing with each partner, or fewer programs or demand generation things, but have those things be adopted with your partners than to have a slew of them. And you know, now that we know the partner set that we have and we know the activities that we want to do, then there's some segmentation that needs to be done from a channel coverage model and an acknowledgement of how how many um, partners that we can do the top end activities with versus the middle versus the bottom. And so this is a simple three level model where it you know, puts field um, partner account managers with your strategic and key partners and they do things like a joint business plan, practice development, an enablement plan and they manage the partner vendor relationship with a defined set of partners. The ones that fall into the middle might be partners that you're working with in the mid-market that do significant volume there, but you know, maybe not enough to have a, a full-time outside sales or a full-time direct field rep with them. And so you have an inside sales uh, or inside channels um, kind of function that manages lighter touch versions of what the direct partner is doing with them. And the plans that they do with them might be more menu driven, like the things, if you're going to do marketing with them, they're going to have less things that they can spec themselves and more things that you choose off a, a menu. At the bottom you have the rest of the partners who you still need to manage to grow the group as a whole, but in general these are going to be managed by the distribution function at your companies, 
and therefore they need a lot of deliverables in terms of self-service enablement, marketing, customer presentations, et cetera. And the point of this is that these partners, you know, probably a handful of those are going to move up in the next year to the mid-tier. And so this becomes a, a training ground and that kind of thing for developing your next generation, but also helping to get the productivity out of the bottom tier, realizing that you don't have enough resources to cover them all yourself. Yeah, John, and I think you know that productivity is a key piece, right? Whether you're making them successful in the in the in the layer that they're going to be in, or whether you're moving up to another one, I think a key is that in your in your next slide, how we sell to you know, who, who, yeah. are, who are the ones so, we should be working with and how, right? Yeah, and so there's a lot of things. Um, work at your partners, how much of your product do they sell and, and how do they rank? And so, you know, the key points on here is if you look at the top two rows for extraordinary and productive, which in this example we've um, designated as selling productive is in between 500,000 to 1 million per year of your product and greater than 1 million a year of your product uh, in the other case, realizing that these people sell across multiple vendor lines. That tends to be a very small percentage of the partner sales representative population. So these are the kind of people that you need to actually have outreach to, build communities for, get their input on what things are going to make you a better salespeople so you can be forward looking, um, engage them in the right way with your, with your sales teams in the field. The other thing to look at is down at the bottom, poor is it, you know, meaning that they sold less than 100,000 per year is actually a huge percentage of the partner sales rep population. And so my key point on here is that anything that you can do to onboard new sales reps at your partners in a better way, in a more consistent and productive way, and move those guys up to at least average to good, over time you'll get a huge bang for them. So focus on the top and do some, you know, do some great work on the onboarding process on the bottom with that finite number of sales reps and, you, and you'll end up with better results. Yeah, you know, and in the incentive world that we live in, I, I think that matches up really well, John, and we're seeing you know, it's not just reward for sales, but onboarding, how well, not just how quick, but how well. So a lot of behavior modification uh, re really being rewarded these days. Yeah, and also the ability to ask the ones at the top, what's the things that you really need from us to be more successful? And a lot of the stuff that they'll come up with is not going to be, I needed spiff for selling wireless this month. Yeah, absolutely. And so as we start to wind it down, I think this is a good slide that sort of pulls it together. And this is, you know, you know a real-world success story. You can kind of walk us through that, and then we'll, then we'll finish it up on the key lessons learned. Yeah, and so, I mean, this will, this will tie into, you know, if the, you go back to what the strategic imperatives for this specific example were, one of them was that we needed to have, um, you know, a focus on new account acquisition. So we'd gone through and segmented our partners and and done that, and there had also been some deal registration things that's been put into place. Um, what we found is that their existing deal registration program, you know, had really low adoption for the partners, and most of the partners rarely used the used the program. And when they did use it, it actually was too administrative because the pricing that they were given on deal registration, you no, know, usually necessitated secondary special pricing because if the pricing that was given on that wasn't enough to meet kind of street level. And so the approach that we brought to this is, you know, first of all, from a pricing standpoint, we looked at what, you know, what they were giving versus what, they was, what people were buying it at so we could try and figure out where that they needed to be on their pricing in order to not have to do special pricing, you know, all the time. We analyzed the historical partner usage and adoption, and, you know, specifically we looked at not only, you know, this vendor had more than a thousand partners, but we said you might have more than a thousand partners, but of the partners that really matter, 
you know, which is one to do multiple transactions with you a year because no one's going to learn how to use your deal registration system if they're only doing one transaction. You know, you have more in the 200 range, and so those those 200 should be the ones that you actually get, you know, aware of this, using it once, and ultimately, you know, repeat using it multiple times. And then we uh, looked at the program usage in benchmarking versus. Uh, other best-in-class vendors. And so here is an appropriate usage of benchmarking, but notice it's been done after that we actually collected the customer data. And then from my advice and changes standpoint, we targeted a specific group of partners, about 200 or so, and we put in place, you know, how many of those we were going to make aware, which was 100% of those, how many of them had actually trialed the deal registration program, which we had a target of 90%. And then of the 90% that tried, how many of them were actually using it multiple times, which hopefully was most of them. Um, we revamped the program rules to drive more value, and we changed the pricing level to cover 80% of the deals not needing special price. As a result of this, we were able to improve the dollars closed by 120% in the first year. And the number of partners of the 200 that we were targeting that were using the program tripled to 90% of the intended segment. Yeah, those are those are great results, John. And and so so maybe you can wrap it up with uh, the key lessons learned. Yeah, and so I guess it, we're just going to recap some of the key things that we've learned through going through this example and and some of the things that we found. But number one, segment your customers and your partners um, to drive accountability. I uh, you put in place plans to treat marketing, sales, and key partners as an ecosystem, and so. If the, you go back to um, kind of the activity matrix and that kind of thing, I mean, you need to spend your time working across teams at your company in the right way in order to drive the right results. Um, it was important for us in this particular example to build territory sales plans with the sales teams that actually aligned to the partner plans that were put there within their region so we could show how that the channels um, the channels plan actually aligned to help the sales team make their numbers. We focused on the few critical partners and partner sales reps that mattered, and we actually also focused on the, the critical activities that mattered to do with those partners. And specifically, we also established partner sales targets and incentives specifically to drive what you need. And so, you know, deal registration was one thing that we talked about. There was also things that was put in place to incent partners to sell across the product portfolio, the three to five product categories that we had in the example. Um, and therefore, those that exhibited that behavior were able to earn more money. All right. Thanks, John. Uh, oh, Peter, you want to jump in? Go ahead. Sure. Uh, thanks, John. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, great information here. As I mentioned, we've got John and Stephen's contact information. Uh, available here, so if you have to either then help talk about the data and any of the things that were discussed, please feel free to do so. We've got a few moments to answer some questions, and I've got um, a couple here. If you've got additional ones, um, please feel free to enter those now. We'll, we'll spend a few minutes running through some of them. First off, I see uh, a couple of people just asked if the slides are going to be available. I know there's a ton of data that we went through. Um, yes, that will be available. We'll have a link out to you. Uh, within the next day or so, following up with that uh, information, so you'll be able to to go through these, come through them uh, at your own leisure as well. Um, additionally, um, question I have, and I, I think um, John, this really is probably directed towards you. There's a question here about it says we struggle with field engagement and being able to manage that. You know, what are some steps to really start driving that, um, and and how do we move down that path? So not knowing the specifics of the person that answer or that asked the question, I mean, you know, step one would be to define what you expect out of the partners, you know, from both a sales and a channel standpoint, and have some internal agreement on that. And then, you know, when that you do that, then I think that you know the thing that's going to cement a lot of this together is, you know, start to work with them in the planning process, meaning start to work with the sales team in the planning process to show how and where that the channel um, can add value. And you know, ultimately, when you start to get external on this, then 
when you have the internal agreement, then one of the things that many vendors try and do is actually get some rules in place for how that partners will be treated, you know, on specific opportunities, you know, in the case when the partner brings it in, in the case when um, the vendor brings it in, or in the case when it's an RFP response uh, that multiple partners may be responding to. And so if you start to look at those kind of scenarios and sort out your own laundry in turn, you want happen with the channel and how that you can have that you best work between sales and marketing then you can start to build on top of that uh, as that you do your rules of engagement out to the field yeah I think that's great and and, and uh, you know at CCI we talk a lot about incenting uh, the partner base but what you're talking about I, I think is kind of the second piece of that is making sure that your internal metrics that your commission structures that your incentives internally align with what you're trying to do uh, in your channel and making sure that your partner account managers, your salespeople are aligned because if you have those two kind of running in different directions, you're, you, you're going to see the engagement drop off. Steve, I don't know if you have anything to add around that one. No, I, I, yeah, I think, I think that's, I think as, as well as you can do on a short answer for a big question. <laughs> Um, I see closely tied to the the comment about the uh, slides going out. Somebody asked if we're going to have a recording. They, they joined a few minutes late. Yes, we will absolutely have a recording. We'll send that out along with the slides um, to be able to uh, to watch this in its entirety um, and within just a couple of days. We just need to process that, and then we'll send it to everyone. With yeah. That. yeah, I just want to take a moment too to actually really thank John. I, this is really interesting for us to sort of move in a little bit of different direction and really focus on on the sales piece. I really thought that field, field engagement slide, thir that slide 13, is, is, is the crux to, to so much of it. And we run into that and we hear that uh, all, all the time. And it's never as easy as it sounds. But having a great matrix and a, and a way to process to start working through that, I think, is, is, is just absolutely key. Yeah, and at the end of the day, I mean, a lot of the value that your channel is going to see is, is uh, from any vendor is going to be like, how easy is it? know or how consistent is it to work with the sales teams in the field you know and you know work in a way that allows us both to make money some of it's in your incentive structure but you know a bigger piece is in actually how that you interact on a daily basis and so part of the activity stuff is actually to say what's the things that we should be spending our time with with the partners and with the sales team so that we actually get the result that we both want yeah, you need to stop talking out, John. You're going to kill it because John and I are going to do a podcast. We agree we're going to do a podcast on this. And probably, I'm telling you, John, we could do a podcast on the field engagement. That's slide 13 alone. So, so don't kill it all and don't give it all away, right? <laughs> Folks, you're going to have to listen to the podcast uh, uh, as, as it comes out for that. Or they, or they could just call you. That'd be just as easy as well, right? Sure. Yeah, I've got one here. Um, kind of a broad question, so I'll let you guys kind of choose how you want to attack this. It says, do you normally work with sales groups or marketing groups? My assumption is, John, specifically on your side, you'll wind up working with both, but maybe this question is framed more around what's the entry point um, to, to start the work that you're doing to start driving some of these things you're talking about, like field engagement. Um, so it, it, either one of you have a, a thought around that one? I know it's very broad. Well, I guess that the, for us, I mean, we work with both groups. Um, and, you know, my, I tend to work probably more with the sales teams than with, with pure marketing teams, and my partner tends to work more with the marketing teams. But at the end of the day, I mean, for me, they both need to work together, right? And so, you know, if you go back to that whole cost of sales model discussion, I mean, part of the thing that if you want your company to grow in the right way and that you're trying to sell in the mid-market, then you have to make people understand or you have to help people understand the, mod, the, the points that you need to invest in are different than what you need to invest in the direct. And so if, you, if you're interested in more sales or money, then you need to consider doing things this way. And so that tends to be a conversation that, you know, we have with sales, but also with finance and with marketing. Because ultimately the executives at every company want to make more money or have their stock price go higher or be higher valuation or whatever. And, you know, you're not going to get that over time if the, you're not a profitable business that's running efficiently. You know, at the beginning you can grow really fast and get it just on sales growth, but if the, you, you know, you would have more sales growth if the, you actually had an efficient model that was actually leveraging channels the right way too. 
Yeah, and then, and then on and then on our end, you know, historically very much in the side, and, and there was a lot of I'm sure John used to see this too. There were a lot of silos, and, and and now once again you can trace it all the way down to the buyer's journey and what what needs to be delivered from the top all the way through to the ultimate ultimate buyer. Uh, we're seeing a, a lot of efforts uh, from the marketing groups that we mainly work with, uh, and in having their conversations with with more. Uh, with the sales team and, and, and getting uh, more alignment and more involved in, in those big picture discussions as, as the ultimate customers are looking for as much affirmation as information that that buyer's journey um, is, is really changing all of that and we're seeing some organizations and I'm sure you do as well John uh, moving faster uh, to, to, to that um, that sort of a uh, 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 model uh, of, of way of working and, and, and some, some a little bit slower. Right. And one thing I'd point out around the, the why we started with the customer standpoint, I mean, regardless if I'm working with executives, if I'm working with marketing or if I'm working with sales, if my point is that, look, I asked your customers what they wanted and this is what they told me and then someone says, well, I don't agree with you because of X and then it's like, well, I, you know, it's not, I'm not here to tell you that this is my viewpoint. My view, you know, I'm here to tell you this is what your customers are saying. And so, if you want to be better, then you should listen to these kind of things, um, because that this isn't, you know, John Erickson or Channel Impact telling you what the thing is. This is what your customers are requesting from you in order to do more business with you in the future. And you no, know, that t that tends to focus people's efforts in the right place because it's not one opinion versus another, it's what they, your customers said they wanted from you, your company in order, you know, to meet their needs. Okay. Great, great. Thanks, guys. Well, that's what we've got for today. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. John, a, a big thank you to you for coming and sharing with us. I think uh, a lot of great data here and information. Um, as I said, everyone will have the slides and recording out to you shortly. We'll get an email to you. Um, and, again, contact information um, up on as the ultimate customers are looking for as much affirmation as information that that buyer's journey um, is, is really changing all of that and we're seeing some organizations and I'm sure you do as well John uh, moving faster uh, to, to, to that um, that sort of a, a, a model of, of way of working and, and, and some some a little bit slower right and one thing I'd point out around the, the why we started with the customer standpoint I mean, Regardless if I'm working with executives, if I'm working with marketing, or if I'm working with sales, if my point is that, look, I asked your customers what they wanted, and this is what they told me, and then someone says, well, I don't agree with you because of X, and then it's like, well, I, you know, it's not, I'm not here to tell you that this is my viewpoint. My view, you know, I'm here to tell you this is what your customers are saying. And so if you want to be better, then you should listen to these kind of things um, because they, this isn't you know, John Erickson or Channel Impact telling you what the thing is. This is what your customers are requesting from you in order to do more business with you in the future. And, you no, know, that, that tends to focus people's efforts in the right place because it's not one opinion versus another. It's what they, your customers said they wanted from you, your company in order, you know, to meet their needs. Okay. Great. Great. Thanks, guys. Well, that's what we've got for today. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. John, a, a big thank you to you for coming and sharing with us. I think a, a lot of great data here and information. Um, as I said, everyone will have the slides and recording out to you shortly. We'll get an email to you. Um, and again, contact information um, up on the screen. So uh, if you'd like to discuss further or, or would like to um, dive into any of this material with us one-on-one, -on -one, we're more than happy to do that with you. So thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Have a wonderful rest of your day.